and uh, take that full screen. Probably my best image, to be honest. Right. So um, that's effectively my website, which you're not bothered about. These are the people I uh, currently work with. Um, I do a lot of the write-ups for Lighting Rumours. Um, I should get the images. Um, I do a lot of write-ups for Photography Academy, um, Official Photography for the World Food Championships, and I've given lectures at the World Food Championships blog this summer. It all sounds very interesting, but it isn't. Elincrom and Olympus, I'm an ambassador for Elincrom and also Olympus. Now, where I started, okay? Um, second from the left would be me at the age of 15, which is when I started my paid career. If only I knew then what I know now, I'd have done something far more interesting. Okay, automotive photography. Fascinating image insofar as, um, go on, anyone got, Rough ideas as to the speed that we're shooting this at, the speed of the vehicle, and how it was done, just roughly. And I'm taking you through from basic stuff through to a little more interesting. Shout out, Mike, if anyone says any kind of speed of the car. No, I mean. Nobody? Right. Okay. Not yet. I don't think no. they realise this was an interactive quiz, Michael. You challenged them to. To interact with other human beings. Was it stationary? No, it was four miles an hour. We were walking alongside it. We were using a shutter speed of one thirteenth of a second. The camera was attached to the car just with two suction cups and then zip tied across that on a tripod. Um, walking along, just a manual press of the um, shutter release. It was a D3 back in the day. But it gives you the impression of speed. Okay, it's far easier than trying to kill the camera at bloody 90 miles an hour. So, this is where we start doing things a bit more interesting, uh, creating more drama in the image. This image was for the uh, launch of the Jeep in 2011. When you mentioned one carter, this was then carter equipment. It's actually shot just with one light. It happened to be a very large beauty dish. You know, they do, um, I think it's a 72 centimetre beauty dish, or they used to. And it gives um, a very broad but focused light. Um, and this was taken, it's a, a nature reserve, which obviously we managed to plough up quite nicely. Um, and it was doing these sort of images, I realised that I was getting um, more interest from the clients I was delivering the images to. And also it was generating more interest with prospective clients. I think it was the dramatic skies and um, the fact that the vehicle would pop against the sky. Does any of that make sense? It's an old nod. I've got one nod, so that'll do. This was for the launch of the, well, at the time it was a new Cooper S with the twin turbo. Um, very basic lighting on this. It's, really nothing more than three speed lights across the back with um, a couple of smoke pellets let off um, and one softbox. That was basically it. Um, there's nothing difficult about this image. It was just tripoded camera, um, standard exposure, kind of around 125th, um, enough depth of field to get the whole car in. And that was it. It really didn't take much to work it out. Your main problem is actually trying to get rid of the reflection. And you'll see on this one, we've actually got some. We've got uh, one on the door and two by the light. And this was before I started to realise, you know, cars tend to look better without too much by way of reflections. At the time, these were easily accepted by clients. They weren't looking for anything different. I'm going too fast. Um, tough. Now, moving on to the motorcycles. Um, this is where we started to try and increase more of the drama. Uh, it's just an overcast day. Um, and by dropping the background, so we're actually underexposing the main ambience, 
and then bringing up the main subject with, with the lights. It's only two lights on this. And most of the automotive stuff you'll see is just two lights. Um, my biggest concern was the, you see the bulbous front on the sidecar. Yeah. Uh, that was going to reflect a lot more of the light. And the initial test shot, I ended up with a flare up pretty much right in the center. And just by moving it, it was only a couple of feet to frame right. Um, the focus of the light was then towards the engine. Of course, the engine had been covered in grease to get very little by way of reflection back. That ate any reflection that was going to come back towards me. Um, you can just make out on the chrome strip on the edge of that sidecar the small amount of reflection I've ended up with, but not from anywhere else. This was um, over in Wales about 2016, I think, might have been earlier than that. An old Indian motorcycle. And the one thing you'll notice is the sidecar is actually on the wrong side. The German bike, German owned bike. So then we go on to here. Now, as you look at it, it doesn't look a particularly difficult shot. This was uh, an engineer who was a motorcycle engineer, and most of his work is just one of the mill stuff, repairing um, just standard bikes and all the rest of it, same as any other shop. It's got a sideline where he actually restores what he classes the older bikes and the vintage bikes, the classics, this being one of them. And here, what I was after would be a hint of the workshop to keep it in context. We'll get the, the beauty of the bike itself across. Now, looking at that, it doesn't look a particularly difficult shot, but that's one of the bikes I shot on the same day. And you can see the kind of area I was working in. The lights aren't off or anything. And in fact, that's the workshop. And you can see on the right, one of the lights, the other light is in front of the bike that's on the elevated stand. You can just make it out in front of the handlebars on that bike. So the lights are gridded, so as we end up with a pool of light, those two shots gives us this bike here. Okay. Do we have any questions? Do you want to know the settings, the equipment? Uh, there's, the a question, there's a question just come up. Do clients ask for a lot of retouch work for reflection removal? Um, I'm a lazy bastard. I try to, to make sure I don't have any reflections. Um, these are um, pretty much straight out of camera. They will have been an added uh, vignette just to ensure it was darkened off at the outside. But um, particularly that one, uh, there's very little retouch on that. There's, you'll notice a circular shape, which is the pool of light from frame right. And you can then see the highlights brought in by the higher light that's frame left. And that's allowed to spill on the back to bring up the, the toolbox. But on this one, there wasn't a great deal. Um, a little later, I'll actually take you through the post-processing on one of the images. Classic car market just lately. I don't know whether you remember the classic car market had a huge boom um, early 2000, 2005. When we had the turn down in the market, 2008, classic cars fell a huge amount. Well, it started coming back. Um, this was actually a proof of um, how do you put it? proof of finished article. It was uh, two man company based just outside Blackpool. They buy the cars to order and completely restore them. This was nothing more than a shell. It had nothing else in it. It was a complete butter shed. Um, and this is the standard to which they restored it. This was actually going out to a chap in Australia. Um, the two lads, they actually live on a farm, which meant I had access to a cow shed. So, we could do this. This was more, not so much as proof of, work, proof of purchase, proof of finished work. It was more for them for their website. This one again, two lights, uh, and on the front corner, 
the reflections that you can see is the point from the frame right and the point from frame left. I tend to place the lights so as it was straight on towards 90 degrees to the side of the car. And because of the camera being at 45 degrees to the car, so it's from the corner, I'm not going to get any kind of reflection because, of course, like traveling in straight lines, it hits a surface that is straight on to it and it's going to come back towards the light, not towards the camera. And the same on the front end, I have the light quite high, firing straight down towards the front of the car. Um, I tend not to get reflection from that one either. Does that make sense? Yeah, you said, said Mike, about the fact that you were using, I don't know, some of the dish gridded, gridded reflectors in there. Do you tend to go for yeah. anything like bigger ref modifiers or is there, is there an issue between big and small modifiers? There's a huge issue. Um, the modifier of choice is a 45 degree or 65 degree reflector. So it's, you know, the long tulip shape? Yeah. Um, and that throws the light much further. Um, the 45 degree generally gives you two and a half times more light output. So if you're shooting with, say, a 400 watt second light, it's the same as shooting with a 1200 watt second light. The output increase is quite tangible. Um, generally speaking, I don't use a grid because it makes it too restricted. Um, there are times such as using the motorcycle because it's a smaller vehicle. The grid is worthwhile because you don't want it spilling everywhere, certainly indoors, because I like to shut down the ambience so much. Something like this in here, because it's such a big building, it's not likely to uh, illuminate the whole of the building anyway. So it's fine. Um, this, you know, it was, I think, the 65 degrees, so it's a slightly wider throw. And it still gives you about twice the amount of light put, output anyway. Okay. And a question's come up. Do you ever like the interior or is that a client's choice? I do like the interior, um, which I'll come to as we go through this one. Um, this is a portfolio shoot for the car to go on to a dedicated classic car sales site. This is a high-end site. And what they need uh, is decent imagery because at the end of the day, the imagery is going to sell the, the vehicle. So... I'm looking for is uh, a number of shots regarding the exterior of the car to give a um, good feel for the quality of the finish for the restoration. And then you have um, interior shots, engine bay again, detailed stuff, and of course the interior. Yes. Because if you're, if you're trying to photograph black and sunshine, you know yourself, it just, you end up losing all sorts. It just eats any kind of work that's there. So it's supplemented with, this was done with a, an 80 by 80 folding softbox. You know the type of softbox that the folding type with the wire frame, as you undo it, it flips up and takes your nose off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was one of those. I'm quite lucky because I get to, I wish I got to drive, but I don't. I get to photograph some quite interesting cars. This was a very rare McLaren prepared Mercedes, the old Datsun. Again, this would be shot for the, um, an auction site, I think it was. It might well have been a retail site. Uh, and again, you're, now, throwing it, you're throwing it on those ones, Michael, outside. You're throwing in extra light. Always, none of my vehicles are ever just ambient. Every one of these with a minimum of two lights on them. You can see on this uh, Datsun, you've got a bit of a ping far right just underneath the spoiler, and you've got a tiny dot uh, mid door. And you'll see there is a ping here right on the, the bumper at the front between the indicator and the headlight. Um, the reason you can tell it's lit as well, if you look under the car, you've got a double shadow. Do you want to work out whether the car's been lit or not? Always look at the shadows. Ignore the car, look at the shadows. That will give everything away. Go back that way. Um, again, you can see the light. Now that's on the bumper there, just behind the rear wheel. 
that's come from the light, which is frame left, straight onto the door. If you've got old chrome bumpers, you're going to be screwed for uh, reflections. And if you take the reflections out on chrome, it doesn't look right. You have to leave, or well, at least minimise them, so there's something there. Uh, and occasionally I've intentionally made sure I've got something there. Um, otherwise the chrome can look matte. And that can affect the cell value. Now this isn't mine, that Christ. This was a customer's image who's sent to me says, is this good enough to go on the website? So after about 15 minutes, I've managed to settle myself down and not laugh long enough to actually phone her back and say no. So this um, is where we started with the shoe. We positioned the car, so we've got an interesting background. Enough room around it to pick about with the lights. Um, fat guy on the left is me. Um, you'll see we've got um, the frame right light. It's not straight on. What I've done is I've angled this slightly forward so it's off 90 degree, but firing towards the door. That ensures that any reflected light then comes off going backwards, not forwards towards the camera. The camera, by the way, is a Fuji medium format. And then the light frame left is just straight onto the bonnet as I was talking about before. Now, before I go any further, I'll explain what I'm about to do with the camera in this car. What the shots you've seen, they're just straightforward, single image, lit, and then processed. Um, I, to increase the, shall we say, the drama within an image, um, I will sometimes, and I've been doing it far more recently, um, bracket the shots. Now, as you're aware, the standard bracketing, which you would use for architecture, is aperture priority, and then you'll just let the shutter up and down as needed. You can't do that with flash, as you know. If you do it with flash, you're going to screw everything up because all that's going to happen is it's going to affect the, the ambient, not the flash, and the standard angle chance of it going beyond your sink rate anyway. So you can't do it on aperture because it just screws everything up. You end up with funky depth of field. So the final option, of course, is ISO, which affects everything. So here, what I tend to do is I'll find the ambient I'm happy with, get a test of it shot, uh, and I usually start off ensuring that I've got the ambient about a stop below where I want it to be, um, and the camera brought up the flash to where I need it to be. Um, that would be shot at 200 ISO. Usually 125th, because that's what my camera is since being at. I can get away with 160th because on the Fiji medium format, the shutter curtain shadow is actually at the top of the frame, which of course tends to be sky when you shoot the car. Um, so it didn't show up because it's ambient. Whereas the shutter curtain, obviously, the shadow um, is only seen when it's been a problem for flash. So shooting at 200 ISO gives me my base, um, and I use an app, the Fiji app to control the camera, to then drop the ISO to 50, take a shot then, ISO to 100, take a second shot, ISO at 400, another shot, and the final shot at 800 ISO. The questions I tend to get is, well, what about noise? And for a start with the medium format, noise at 800 isn't really an issue. But if you're doing this with other cameras, you'll also find it's not really an issue because in the process of merging the bracketed images, you'll find that the, the noise is actually taken out just by the software. Okay, now that's a single frame. That would be the one at 200 ISO processed. You'll notice that the color is slightly lighter because it's lit higher than the, than the ambient. The ambient is taken down the pad. Okay, so this is a single frame before merge with the other four, just so as you know what we're looking at. All right. Next frame is the merge set of five before further processing. And to be perfectly honest, you see the difference? I'll just flick back and go from that to that. Now the color of the car um, in 
Lightroom, I ensure the color is correct. Okay, because what you can get, particularly in the red spectrum, if you overlight, it goes bleeding pink. Bloody horrible. So with your final image, which you get with Lightroom, you end up with DMG. Just ensure that the card's the correct color, and that ensures the rest of the frame is where I want it to be, which will be below by full stop. But what it gives me with the merged image is a lot more contrast in the clouds, if you look at that, and also a lot more contrast in the stones. More detail in the shadow areas. Same with the car, hold on, too far that one. Same with the car, in the wheels, uh, in the foliage, there's more details, okay? This then gives me um, my merged image. And I'm only using Lightroom to merge because it gives a nice vanilla merge. It's not the retinal burn stuff that you tend to get with some of the software. It's just best straightforward. I don't even think about it. I select five, I hit control, shift H, and that just sets it off. I don't even bother trying to make any kind of adjustments to any of the images until after I've merged. When I've merged with Lightroom, I end up with this image, which that's fine. There's very little by way of tweaking I'll do in Lightroom before I export it, other than ensuring the car is exactly matched. Most of the times the cars are absolutely fine. What I find is there's a certain colors that drift a little with merging, red being the worst. Um, this was slightly lighter than it should have been. And we're only talking about a third of a stop, hardly anything to actually bring it back. Once I'm with that, I just do an export. There's nothing else to do in Lightroom. I then take it into Photoshop. This is the finished image. Um, my next stage would be to use something like Nick Tools, um, or I'll actually duplicate the layer, increase the contrast in the Adobe Raw um, plugin, um, and then brush through where I needed it. If you notice, I've increased the contrast again in the stones, and the tree behind in the center, and in the foliage, and in the clouds to increase the drama. That's basically it. Question, Mike. The um, control colors. Do you use the you know uh, color passport, the passport checker, or do you use a grey card or anything else like that? Okay, I'm trying to find an excuse to as to why I don't. I haven't really got an excuse. Um, that's awful, really, isn't it? No, I don't. <laughs> the stones are grey. You're fine. To be honest, uh, if I'm shooting products in the studio, um, it's always grey carded. Um, there's a lot of stuff that I will grey card and I'll colour grab for, make sure it's absolutely spot on. With cars, um, there's a little more leniency. It depends how it's going. And for me, I tend to remember and can tell on the back of the camera how close we are. Um, not yet had a single automotive image be buffed on the grounds of colour, consistency or anything. Um, and to be perfectly honest, um, whilst I'm doing this stuff, there are some behind the scenes to shot on the phone and it's surprising how well a phone would give you a good reference. Um, but with most automotive stuff, I don't colour balance. It's not the same kind of requirements. I, found, I suppose really. on the same question on that is, you get these cars that change colour depending on the angle of the light. Yeah, they're really interesting. Can we move on, please? <laughs> 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 to be honest, uh, we're talking about wraps, uh, wrapped vehicles, um, and there's one coming up, which you'll see. Okay. Now, this is a vehicle we just talked about being wrapped. That is not my image. Please do not think for one second this is my sodden image. It's not. The lad that owns the company, oh, that was based at my wife, not at mine. My, the lad that owns this company, Cash, a really nice lad. He's actually become um, one of the UK's best vehicle wrapping companies. He travels around the world. He teaches wrapping skills on behalf of the um, manufacturer of this particular wrap material. And this was the same color shifting bloody stuff that Mike's just mentioned. So this was Ash's uh, effort that he had on the website. 
um, sent me an email saying, I've got this vehicle, the company vehicle, his own, um, we've wrapped it, this is what I get. It doesn't do the rap justice. What am I doing wrong? This was his other shot. Now, you'll see how it's very pink here, and yet it's more purple there. <coughs> so, standard apply, it's dead easy. I know exactly what you're doing wrong, you're doing it yourself. <laughs> This is where we ended up, uh, which is a deserted car park, which is no longer there. They've pulled it down. Okay. Now you see the reflector mic. That's the forty-five degree. It's a long throw. Okay. Um, it gives you two and a half times the output, so you can have it much further out. So you can keep it out of frame, um, or you can turn it down so it's not chucking loads of bloody power through it. Again, you can see where I've set the camera. The uh, the ape swinging off the light in the background is me. And then you can see the other light, frame left, which again is straight on to the bonnet. So you can see that the path of light from that light source would be straight to the car. Any bounce back would be straight back towards the light, not towards the camera. Do you follow? Mm -hmm. One of the easiest tricks I find is just imagine that any vehicle you're photographing is wrapped in chrome. If you think that you can see the light, or your light source in that chrome, you're going to get a flashback, providing you still where your camera is. All right? So, what did this actually give us? Do you see the puddle of water it stood in? That's what it gave us. On um, this, um, I severely dropped the ambient, as you can tell. Um, and then lit. Now you'll see that the color is more controlled on this compared to the shot that Ash had. Front 45 and then a rear 45. Okay. Now, there are times when I'm lighting the vehicle not for the image that we're looking at, but how I want the image to end up. Now, you can see that's basically overlit. We've got a very bright lorry. It's a, it's a tiny refuse lorry um, for the small estates that are going some towns. Um, bearing in mind, refuse lorries are very early morning. Um, this was supposed to represent early morning pickup on a summer's day. It's going to be about as summer as it's likely to get in bloody February. So, it was lit to that extent, and then the post-processing took it to that. Okay. This was small enough that it could be shot with just two lights again. And again, it would be straight onto the front. And on this vehicle, it would be at the side, but again, slightly angled towards the rear to make sure there wasn't a thing back. Mainly because at the bottom, you see where you've got that frame between the wheels. Uh, the front column is a column at the front of the frame is curved. And if it was straight on, I would have gotten just a touch of flare at the top of it. So, moving on, some of the lorries. This was in um, London for the London uh, scrap metal company. Was. Okay. This again was a bracketed shop. And it took three times as long as it should have done because the sun was in and out like a pig in the oil. So usually I get the first couple of frames fine and then the sun disappeared. So I have to restart again because by the time the sun came back out, the clouds had shifted too much. And it would have screwed up the composition. Same technique again. And again. Now, one of the bonuses was, particularly this one, instead of just getting three birds, I ended up with dozens, which made it just a little bit more interesting. Now, even the lorries this size, you can get away with using just two lights, which is what these were. And again, you can see the Double shadow.
This was huge. Uh, this was taken Saturday just on the car um, and I ended up having to use four lights purely because of the length of them thing. That is your lot, gentlemen. And if any of you are still awake, congratulations. Uh, cheers to that, Mike. I think what Simon normally does at this point is open up the mics for any questions because it's, I mean, what it really is to me is it seems that you've got a simple, effective solution for the lighting that deals with 99% of the issues. It does. Um, there's some clever bugger out there that would throw a spanner at you, though. Yeah, questions. I don't know. I don't know about clever uh, question, but um, I noticed that you're using um, these uh, long throw reflectors. Obviously, those are hard light sources and sm smaller light sources. Is that you know a deliberate choice rather than a, a big soft box is going to reflect? It is a big, a big soft box it is, is going um, to reflect in the, in the material. It is because um, a small light source. I mean, on that last load that you saw, I used four light sources. I needed two long throws because I had to keep the lights out of the frame. But two of the lights could be much closer. So they were just standard reflectors, the standard ELB 500 reflectors, which is you know, it's just small. Um, but the, you want to keep the light sources quite small. So if you do get a reflection of it and you can see it in the car, it's much easier to take out than something like a 150 octa. If you use a 150 octa and you can see it in the car, you're going to end up taking the door out. <laughs> well, I suppose it more, looks more like a natural specular highlight as well. It does. I mean, this is why it worked, as you could see on the Datsun. Um, I actually needed some highlights on the Chrome there. Um, I've had it before now where I've ended up using a speed light just to put a spotlight on a, a reflection. Um, bit of a sparkle into some of the chrome to make sure you could see that it was chrome and not just part of the paintwork because it was a, a chrome bumper on a, a white NGB. And without the ping of the light showing up, it just looked like it was all white. It's a very complex shape or if it's a very big shape. The, the last image was taken on Saturday and that had a 40 foot tray on it. 40 foot? I don't know, it was bloody huge anyway. Um, but certainly cars, motorcycles, and the lights aren't as bright as you might think. Um, quite a lot of those, you end up with an output on the Allen Crump system of four, which is equivalent to about a hundred, about a hundred watt seconds. So you'd almost in speed. Like <coughs> Well, yeah, the other the thing that interested me was what was the Fuji? You said you're using the Fuji medium format. Which one? That's the 50S. The GFX 50S. Yeah, I've had a loan of one of those, and it's an interesting... So it's a 50 megapixel. It is. It's a dangle camera for, certainly for automotive. Um, I will be upgrading to the um, 100S as soon as... I can convince. <laughs> uh, say, <laughs> say quietly how much it is. Yeah, vital quietly. equipment. Actually, it's it, actually it's a really reasonable price piece of equipment for what it is. To be honest, the issue I've got isn't that I want it. The issue I've got is trying to stop Helen from buying it outright now because she's a dancing performing arts photographer. She's stolen my bloody 50S as it is, and she knows that the 100S has got a far better focusing system, so she's after that. So it's not really me wanting to get it. It's me trying to stop her getting it too soon. <laughs> What's your file size? You... <laughs> no, it's not that bad. Um, hang on, I can tell you in a second. On that last lorry shoot, um, the raw files raw files are because I've got the most compressed raw files 51 meg uh, 
The JPEGs are 15 megabytes straight out the camera. And I don't normally shoot raw and JPEG onto the primary card. I do as a backup on the second card. The reason I end up with JPEGs on the primary card is because if you are using the uh, Tether um, smartphone app, so as to shoot and change the ISO, the preview, it automatically converts to a JPEG so you can see it. So I end up with JPEGs as well. But the JPEG on the same file is 15 meg. And then when you do the conversion, you end up with a DNG file that's 164 meg. So considering you've got those huge files, what what do your customers use these photographs for? What, are they printing them out as huge posters or what are their applications? Some of them are. Well, some of them are. And then, of course, um, there are those that just want them for the website. Um, as you know, the biggest argument is, well, it's a waste of time using that for the website. I would actually say it's not because the amount of detail, in fact, let me just prove, I can say I'll prove a point. I'm going to share the screen again. Put this to full. Oh. Right. Can you see that one? Yes? Yeah. Good. Okay. This was shot with a medium format. <coughs> time to firm up. And then... The amount of detail that you actually get is pretty much insane. And even when you take it down to web size, I mean, for me, when I resize for web for the clients, I do them at 24 to 8 on the longest size, and that pretty much covers everything you need to do. They can upload that to Facebook or anything else without any kind of issue. And we lose it on the website. Um, but the detail is still there. I think if you shoot on a D850, you're getting close to those file sizes anyway, or you can do. Um, and something, I, I mean, I, I digress a bit, but I did something the other day. I tried an enlargement from a D850 RAW file using this new super, whatever it is. Super it, resolution. Super resolution. And it does work. I mean, I put the two eye shots up on the, on the thing there. I'm not saying it's, it's better than a medium format, but I would love to see the comparison and see what that would actually bring out. All right. Um, not because I need it, just because I can do. Uh, well, uh, the, I found the image I wanted to show you because uh, this shows it up even better. This was for um, Into Florida. Um, okay. It was for a, a brochure. Now, they hadn't requested high resolution images. They just wanted some nice images for uh, their magazine plus their brochure. Um, they ended up using these for an advertising campaign. And if you want to know just how much detail you get, you can even see the bloody uh, honeycombs on the strips. I'll tell you now. Uh, when I bought the GFX 50, which was dearer than it is now because it's come down quite a bit in price, um, it was worth every bloody penny. It paid for itself within the first couple of shoes. I think I'll have to put the price up from £10 each and buy three for 20 then to uh, afford a GFX, but. <laughs> Tell you what, if you're interested in the GFX 50S, there'll be plenty coming on the market with the 100 hitting the stores. The cost, to be honest, isn't in the camera, it's in the lenses. Where's because the um, quite a lot of the lenses are about two and a half thousand. The thing that I did, didn't like, Michael, was if I'd gone into it, I wanted one with a leaf shutter. Yeah. The, um, yeah, the thing, not how to phrase Oh yeah, the sync, the sync speed is shite. Um, it's 125th of a second. Yeah, you can squeeze a little more out of it, like I was saying before about the, um, sh the shutter curtain shadow is at the top of the frame. So if you're shooting outside, say, with the sky, or if it's not going to be affected by the flash, you can squeeze 
punch the 60th out of it. That's fine. But it's still nothing like most other cameras, which tend to be around 250. I was looking at some of the hassle bags with leaf shutter and you're getting 2,000 to 4,000. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the one thing that surprised me that uh, Fuji haven't gone down because the, the, the camera itself was a, well, so easy to use. At the end of the day, I mean, it depends what you're shooting. Um, if you, there's a lot of my stuff where I'm shooting and using the light duration to freeze any kind of action. My missus, she shoots uh, dance and performing arts. Um, so we will either shoot using the light duration to freeze the, uh, the actual action, or we'll rely on the IGBT circuitry and um, switch to using um, the extended shutter. So we're going high sync and shooting it. Um, you know, she can shoot right up to 4,000 per second then. But of course, you're getting reduced up power output because your flash is actually stuttering to cover the frame. Make sense. Mm -hmm. I think everything's in balance. I'm waiting for the true, what do they call it? Uh, a proper rolling. Double shutter? Not the, well, the rolling shutter, but the proper, not rolling shutter, a global shutter. Yeah, global shutter. I'm waiting for that too. I saw the write-up when they first talked about the development of it a couple of years ago. That's uh, going to be interesting. Somebody's uh, brought it up again. Uh, I think there's, um, they've potentially got a production model coming out. I believe there's something like red cameras, something like that, already have a global shutter for use for the video cameras. Yeah, red yeah. do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and a budget to go with it. Yeah. Yeah, the Canon cinema cameras have got it as well. So. But again, budget to go with it. Well, I think that that's sort of the next big leap. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that. Well, I've obviously upset Phil with his bugged off. Can you let us know what you did so we can do it again? Yeah, I think, I think they're talking um, the rumours on the Canon R one as well, which is the um, the one DX replacement uh, is going to have rolling shutter, global shutter, global shutter. Sorry, yeah, get it right. Yeah, I don't quite know how it works. I don't. I don't... Uh, well, the simplest way of describing it, the standard um, sensor, you know, it's just a, a load of lines basically and it takes a feed start at the top strips it all off and it takes time to get from top to bottom even if yeah. we're talking about you know hundreds of a second or a thousandth of a second the global shutter takes all the lines dumps into a buffer in one go yeah, yeah. Well, what, what i mean is we, we're used to a like a leaf shutter you can see the leaf shutter in front of the, the lens yeah or, you know, in front of the sensor you know a focal plane sh uh, focal plane shutter again so there's a pair of them but on the global shutter, what I don't know is, is there actually a shutter or is this just an electronic readout? No, it yeah, just takes the readout. electronic reading. Yeah. yeah. Same as electronic shutter now on the likes of the yeah. Olympus or any of the mirrorless. Um, problem you get with um, the uh, mirrorless cameras at the moment is if you're um, panning following a subject, by the time the actual uh, image has been recorded, because it does it line at a time, the image moves. Yeah, you get bendy so, lampposts. So you get yeah. Yeah, <laughs> bendy lampposts and stuff like that. With the yeah. global shutter, it takes all the pixels at once and chucks it in a buffer. Yeah, it's a, nice. it's a parallel read as opposed to a serial read. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, no, I saw one last night. Actually, I was looking at one last night where they were saying, this is why I would never buy, um, you sorry, use the electronic shutter. And it was literally a banana-shaped baseball. So it's in the middle of a pitch, and this thing is, is, is really weirdly shaped. <laughs> I just won't shoot baseball. It's cheaper that way. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I had a camera like that once. <laughs> I've seen some of your pictures, Brian. You probably still have. <laughs> None taken. <laughs> 
It is. Um, let's see if I can find it. Extreme um, rolling shutter image. Let's see if I can just share that. I can find my screen. Wrong way. I've got the screens wrong way. Glenn. Yeah, I know. I know. But I've got two screens, and the camera's on one. And the displays on the and everything's covering everything else. Right? I have to say, you're, you're looking more and more like Joe Ninety's lockdown carries on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm working on it. <laughs> I'm working on it. Think up to his name though; it is getting curly. Oh yeah. <laughs> Here we go. I'll never say that. Uh, I wouldn't if I were you, Chris. <laughs> there you go. A bit of extreme rolling shutter. <laughs> Yeah, I've seen a few from props, but I've never seen one quite to that extreme. Yeah, it's um, a good explanation on this site, actually. There you go. That makes sense of it all, doesn't it, now? Uh, I mean, it's all right. I, I, I love Michael Sponsor's The Flash Centre. Well, not The Flash Centre, the Ellingcrom is... The, the, the one thing I have to joke, laugh about is they call it the high-speed head, but it's actually not a high-speed head. It's the low-speed head, yeah. high-speed photography. Yeah. And when I said that to one of the uh, reps on the stand, he got rather annoyed at me. He said, no, 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 it's a high-speed head. I said, no, no, it's a, sp it's a head for high-speed photography. But to sh reshape the, the thing, it was so literally, how do you know this? And I said, well, it's pretty obvious, a bit of electronics. It's the way you've got to do it. But... Uh, I, I thought what was interesting a couple of years ago was the fact that they, they'd always said that HSS is not the way to go, and now, of course, they've got a pack with HSS in it. Yeah, which is the 500. That's what I'm using nowadays, actually. With a phenomenal bit of kit. You know, they've always been known for their sort of short flash durations as well. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. <coughs> no, I can't afford one of those GFX. GFX is no, 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 no. <laughs> GFX 50S, you should be able to pick up for about 3,000 for the body now. Uh, the 100S is five and a half. You're talking 100S, that has only just hit the shops. Yeah. Um, two, I think two seven, I just saw the 50S. That. Yeah. And then you've got to put some glass on it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and the glass will cost about the same. Uh, the two lenses I use the most is the 110 f2 and the 32 to 64 f4. And a two and a half k lens. Yeah, basically. It's interesting because you have you have arguments come up now and again about you know you've got your 50 megapixel DSLRs full frame against the 50 megapixel so-called moving format. The argument is it's going to be the same. It's not. You can actually see a clear difference between the two. One of the, bigger, one, the of the biggest, one of the biggest differences I noticed with sh shooting a medium format is, and it was on, I think it was on a, like a plain grey background, the graduation of tones oh, yeah. is so much smoother than, um, you know, so to so say you've got a, a bit of fall off at the top of the... Uh, to, to where your, your light is strongest, the graduation of tones uh, along that grey scale, if you like, was exceptionally smooth in comparison to what uh, an SLR would give you. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I find the whole experience shooting medium format is very much like the old film days. Um, you think it right away through start to finish. You, I found that with um, the digital cameras, such as the Olympus Red, um, you react a lot quicker, you are thinking on the go and and everything else. The medium format just seems to be a more enjoyable experience. You enjoy thinking more about what you're putting into it, how you are uh, composing the, the shot, the way you're setting the whole thing up. Um, I just find it more enjoyable. Don't tell the guys up in <laughs> Oh, uh, my quick question though, I've asked this before, do you get a different customer reaction when you get the medium format out? Do you yeah. find the customers notice the size of the camera? Yeah, you usually get the new jokes as well, you know. Um, 
OS being identified as size, blah, blah, blah. But um, yeah, um, not necessarily at the time you shoot. Occasionally you do. Um, what you do get, if they've not seen a medium format image before, then you, you do tend to get a reaction when you deliver the images. Because one thing you always tell them is, I'm sending them across in full, uh, not full frame, full resolution and web resolution. Web resolution is blah, blah, blah. But take a look at the full resolution, roll it right up, make sure you're happy with the detail. And I always get a response after that. Hmm. Anyone still away? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we're all still here. Taking it in, taking it in. So all we really need to do is afford a very reasonable three thousand pound uh, medium format camera. Well, at the end of the day, you're getting a hell of a lot for three thousand pounds when you think that the D six is what six and a half. Yeah, yeah. The, the new new Fiji 100S, which is going to knock even the 50 straight out the bloody ballpark. You're talking about 102 megapixels. The amount of detail and the cleanliness of that kind of image is just going to be phenomenal. Mm. And what are they talking in price on that? Five and a half. Yeah, oh, okay. five and a half thousand pounds. Like a D6. Yeah, well, it's, it's a thousand pounds less than a D6. Yeah, it's a thousand less than a 1D. Yeah. But it's horses for courses, isn't it, really? Absolutely. You wouldn't want to be using that at sporting events and things like that. The D100, though, uh, should be fine for sporting events. It's got uh, phase detection. It's not relying on contrast detection like the 50. I'm not, how the hell did I end up a sales bloody rep for <laughs> pissing bloody GFX? Talk yourself so into it. I'm a pig in ambassador for Olympus, not GFX. Don't tell the guys at Olympus. Anyway, <laughs> the... Somebody's already said it, horses for courses. There are clients I wouldn't pick anything else up other than the GFX because it would give them the best image, it's best suited for what they need the images for and for what they want to need, what they're going to do with it. Um, there are others that I wouldn't touch the GFX for and I'd reach for the Olympus. Food imagery tends to always be the Olympus. The um, distance... The actual um, shortest focal distance on the Olympus is pretty insane. It's about two and a half inches in front of the lens. It's not a macro lens, it's just a standard 12 to 40 mil. And the depth of field is, the depth of focus is twice that of a full frame. And it'll be a hell of a lot more than the GFX. So I can get in really close um, and, and hold the shot exactly as I need it. And it's, it's brilliant for food. I would not touch another camera at all for food. Olympus works wonders. Uh, full frame, which is what I used to use for food. Um, I couldn't quite get as close as I wanted. I used to use a D4. Um, and I couldn't um, get the depth of field that I wanted. That was on the 24 to 70 on the D4. But the Olympus it just made it all so much easier. I mean, on the Olympus, I know a couple of people locally that are doing wildlife with the... Um... Mm. There's, there's some something like 150 to 500 mil lens or something ridiculous or 400 mil lens, but the time you focus it in, it's yeah. There's um, the one I have is the 40 to 150, which is equivalent to using an 80 millimeter to 300 millimeter on a full frame, and it's f 2.8 right through, and it's that big. Which, if you've got a very small screen, makes it really tiny, obviously. <laughs> You got a wide angle screen, it's about that big. <laughs> no, it's just the, kind of the well, one of the at least one of the guys I've spoken to in the, recently has said about it is the fact that he no longer could he carry heavy handle a big lens and move into the Olympus. That's why, I, that's why I moved from Nikon because I used Nikon since 1977. I, I used bits of other kit as well because, especially in the film days, you could use use the Tamron with the adapter all too. So you could have several different bodies and use the same lenses. That was fine. It was once it started uh, getting onto autofocus lenses that kind of screwed all that up. So I stayed with uh, Nikon for most of the paid work anyway. Um, but I tried the Olympus and the original Mark I was great, but the, the noise was an issue once you started getting above 800 ISO. 
it was an issue for what I wanted it for anyway. So I still use the B4 for quite a lot of stuff. The low light stuff at weddings or things like that. But I used the Olympus for the food and a lot of the other stuff. And as soon as the Mark II came out, the dynamic range and the noise handling was identical to the D3, Nikon D3. That was fine. I picked up my Olympus Mark II. I went back, picked up the D4 and sold it to Mr. Nacko. Where the hell is he? Oh, uh, no, we can only get his twins on. Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, he had my D4 off me. Well, he's a cheapskate. You wouldn't pay full price for anything. So. No, I'm not going to actually say a word on that because <laughs> the crap out of me next time I see him. <laughs> And especially if he watches the bloody recording. Hi, Jeremy. No, I didn't tell him what you paid. <laughs> <laughs> so with your, yeah, pulling it nicely back to your car work. Oh, um, yeah, that's where I came home, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, does, does the work generally come from commercial companies, from car clubs, from enthusiasts? Where, where, yes. Where's the... Yes. Where, yes. And yes. Mm. Right, uh, Saturday shoot uh, was for a haul, yeah, you saw the wagon. Um, they got in touch direct. Uh, they had a revamp of their website. They've got um, new livery. So that was the first one. There's another one I'll be shooting next month, towards the end of April. And then they'll have a third um, in June. So that's those. Um, the, the wagons tend to come, it all tends to come either from the, the manufacturers, um, when they've had a new uh, either design or uh, like the bespoke body manufacturers, uh, quite often they'll want the images of their product in use because quite often it's one off. Uh, CP Davidson, they build bin lorries. You saw some of their uh, bin lorries in the um, presentation, one in the sunset and that kind of thing. Um, they have the same kind of body that they keep building again. And then you've got the likes of Sterling GP who get an order for a specific body or they have a need for a job to do. So they will then design a body to meet that need. Um, so each one of theirs tends to be different. So they'll have that shot. Cars, um, there's the company um, out near Blackpool where I shoot in car so that it's uh, proof of finished quality. Um, that red alpha went out to Australia. Um, then there's the other classic cars where they actually want the images, basically, to, again, to prove the quality of the work. Um, but the images are then either used on high-end classic car auction sites or on classic car listing sites. Um, and the, the repeat clients have told me that they can tell the difference because they get a higher price there's a chap in Preston. I've shot the, several of the cars for. Um, you saw the silver um, Ferrari. Mm -hmm. And I think I did something like um, 14 cars over a couple of weeks for him. Now, he'd been selling on the same site, the similar cars. He imports them from, back from um, the States or Australia or whatever. He stores them, sells them. So he knows what he usually gets. And he saw uh, an increase in the value on his return so you know, it was great because the um win-win win, win situation isn't it yeah it is and then the, the mclaren that you saw the mclaren prepared mercedes i got that purely because he went straight down to the showroom down the road that deals in um quite rare cars and told them that they needed to up the game and then he put me in there so that's how much he valued the images that he was getting uh, nice. Uh, that, I mean, I'm uh, just looking at that, the one that we that Simon used as your kind of uh, tight, title alpha. shot, which is that, which is the the red alpha. It's, it's a lovely shot, it really is. Um, I can't remember whether that was actually shot with the Olympus. My problem with using the Olympus for automotive work is the most I can get is three bracketed shots because it only goes down to 64 ISO. The native ISO is 200. Uh, and it's only in the latest firmware they've introduced 100 ISO. 
So in theory, I could do 200, 164. So I don't get a full range on that bottom shot. But also, um, I get, um, it's not so much noise, but the whole image can appear a little grainy because it's a small sensor. And the detail that you get with the GFX is just phenomenal, you know? No, it was, it was just a very interesting seeing the the location lighting technique. Mm -hmm. um, it's it almost seems too simple, Michael. Sorry. Well, the <laughs> thing <laughs> is, lighting cars is <coughs> simple because um, if you stand at wherever you want to put the camera and just imagine the whole thing chromed, if you think that you'd be able to see your light from where you're stood, the camera's going to see it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As simple as that. Of course, it's much harder if you're trying to do video cards. Oh, video, that's that moving stuff, isn't it? <laughs> we'll have a catch on. No. Oh. Uh. See some of the soft boxes they use. They're huge and they hang them from above and just yeah. like take up the whole of the car. But they've got it because they're changing angles so that you can't move the light with the camera. No, it gives a nice global light to the whole image though yeah yeah but nowadays that that so much of the car video that you see in adverts is cg oh yeah yeah um and it just it's ludicrous it's really clever but <laughs> yeah but it's just well, i mean you could even lean on false advertising you, you could do. I, I, I want to buy one of these cars that they race around in the desert and then complain that it does actually get dirty because their versions don't. Mm. <laughs> it's cars, though. It's everything these days, isn't it? But you raise the blades and... Yeah. Yeah. I had a customer that uh, they, they make millions of cheap plastic bottles for sauces and every, you know all that kind of stuff. A few pennies each or a fraction of a penny each sometimes but the, the boss wanted a new website and he told the web designer he wants something that looks like the apple website mm -hmm. and he showed him a new apple watch on there that's the kind of look i want and it's obviously all cgi there's two main problems he doesn't have any cgi or computer models of the bottles and secondly his budget isn't quite that of apple no 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 I, I, I can imagine. Uh, um, I practically have a budget. Well, the other advantage having the long throw reflector, Michael, is the fact that if the, tri the stand gets blown over in the wind, doesn't hit the car. Way they does oh. Right, hang on a minute. <laughs> Just stay there. <laughs> oh, I thought you'd upset him then. <laughs> he, he's just coming around to hit you now, Mike. <laughs> yeah. He gets his voodoo doll out the drawer that looks like Mike Wiggs. <laughs> well, this is going to be a Colin Brister model. Right, gents. When it gets blown over in the wind, you end up with edges like this. You see the thing? <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? The, uh, because it's quite a soft metal, it kind of yeah, presses so see, out quite well. See that Lamborghini-shaped dent? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, this was all of about, oh, I don't know, five inches across. When it hit last time, it pulled out quite well, but that bit just won't anymore. <laughs> All adds well, to the texture of the light. Yeah. Well, it's the, or, it's organic. The, interesting, the best part is watching the customer's face. Once you see it starting to go over, don't bother watching the light because it's going to go anyway. You can't reach the damn thing. Not at my age. Watch the customer and watch his face. That's worth it. <laughs> just when it falls towards his car. Well, at the end of the day, these lights are always, um, they're well away from any kind of vehicle because you need to keep them out of the shot anyway. So, I mean, you start shooting the light, you can't get them anywhere nearer than about 25, 30 feet. Mm -hmm. So if they go over, they're not going to hit anything over the ground. Well, it's great just to see their faces. How you found the head, if once that is bounced off the ground, how you, have you lost any bulbs, Mike? Yeah, two. Um, hard enough. One was on a, it was a shoot for, well, I can't remember. it wasn't automotive. And then on one of the automotive shoots, it seemed okay, but it was still firing, but 
um, on the following shoot, it was dead. So it must have cracked it. It must have been fine. And then to do the slow leakage. And then it goes, basically. So I've never been, bolts. never been outside for automotive, but I did a prom once where somebody come and kick the tripod, the lighting stand over. Oh, yeah. And I got yeah. a 60 by 90 Boeing softbox on it with a Boeing's 500. And it, it went in a slow arc and I couldn't get across to it quick enough. But because of the springiness in the rods of the Boeing's um, <laughs> softbox, it actually bounced back up. And it was the way back, oh, yeah. it bounced back up, it skewed to the side, and the transformer panel hit the wall, and literally the back end of the Boeing's 500 fell apart. Oh. <laughs> so if it had been one of those reflectors, it would have probably been all right. It was the fact that it bounced back up was, was the thing. But, it, you know, because I sort of ignored it, I could have stopped the bounce back up if I knew that was going to happen. Yeah. They stood there with this kid, sort of a, you know, your average 16 year old kid with size 17 feet. <laughs> and and he, the, the teacher's going, he didn't mean it. Well, the stand is against the wall for a reason, so that people don't squeeze between the stand and the wall. Mm. Bloody annoying when it does that, isn't it? I mean, most of mine, it's purely because the wind's caught it. That's it. When I've had the. Um, Location shoots where it's a box that's gone over. Usually, I don't get any kind of damage to the the head. I mean, the head's on the kit I'm using because of five wonders. They're literally, that big. That's it. Because yeah, it's so a battery no pack. It's a battery pack, isn't it? Yeah. 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 So there's there's no weight in the head, so it tends to not be any kind of damage. Uh, when it's doing automotive stuff, that's a little more different because, it, of course, when the reflector hits the ground. It's a solid transmission of the impact back towards the head. Sometimes it doesn't have any problem. I mean, well, I wouldn't say sometimes, most times it doesn't. And I've only done two bulbs in Christ knows how many years. So that's not mm -hmm. bad going. That's why. Uh, I, I, I had one where uh, the, similar, it was a, I think it was a prom shoot or an event shoot where I was using um, AD 600s with the extension head. And oh, yeah. the, the stand, you know, these guys come rumbling through this, straight through the light stand, knock the thing over. When I put it back up, tried to fire, it didn't it didn't fire. I thought, oh no. So uh, I thought I'll peel I'll peel back the um the the, the scrim of the of the of the softbox and the bulb fell out. The bulb was fine, it had just dislodged from the head and was sitting inside the softbox. When I when I pulled back uh, the diffuser cover, the bulb fell out and smashed on the floor. Oh, bloody <laughs> hell! Uh, it would it would have been fine otherwise. I was gutted. 